Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. David P. Proden, and welcome to the Week 7 Fireside Chat for Educational Leadership, 655 Pupil Services, and Non-Discrimination with Viterbo University in La Crosse, Wisconsin. This is the final Fireside Chat for this course. The reason I'm wearing the blue shirt, because we are well into spring. All right, this week begins on Monday, March 4th, and concludes on Sunday, March 10th, 2024. After that, on March 11th, you begin the research module. A recap, terrific learning team plans for Bruce. Thanks to Audrey, Jen, and Nicole for granting me permission to share the communication to families letter in Moodle. You will find it posted at the bottom of the announcements section. I encourage you to save it. Be overt. Use photos and images. Have people hold an EpiPen. Replace the word should with must in your plan for Bruce. Proactive measures to mitigate potential bullying or discrimination, which can also be nipped in the bud by demystifying these things for kids. That's, again, involving your librarian with different books related to allergies in the school setting. Smart interactions with your food service and library media. Be an ally with your food service director to limit the frequency of changes of suppliers in a constant effort to save cost. So basically, your food service bids out a contract for the year, and it might be with one supplier, but there might be a change in there saying, you know, due to market conditions and whatever, uh, there'll be different suppliers of applesauce, right, to your district. Well, every time that happens during the year, it changes the uh, contents of the, the food, like how much sugar is an applesauce, and then if something was made on a line where peanuts and other nuts were manufactured. So you don't want a lot of churn with that. And that's something you can advocate with your food service director to your typically business manager to try to be as static with those, those contracts as you can. Okay. Increase your expectations for the role of the library media specialist in obtaining books and coordinating activities to promote allergy awareness. Uh, this person should have a substantial role in Bruce's plan. That person was noted in all of your plans, but I think you can amplify that and include the role of the librarian media specialist even more in Bruce's plan. Bruce's current district cannot legally re-release any medical records to you that the district obtained from third-party providers via a release of information. So your school nurse will need to work directly with Bruce's parents to obtain a signed release of information and secure Bruce's allergy report and recommendations from his doctor. You will always pair a health plan with an IEP or a 504. The health plan alone does not offer any due process rights to the parents. Consult your school attorney for clarification on that. It used to be a practice years ago where you could have that standalone okay. in that health plan, that individual health plan. Um, not so much. Uh, typically, attorneys today would say always pair that with an IEP or 504, again, because then it brings in the due process protections that don't exist just independently with the IHP. Food service and not some random website that you found. Food service has a list of acceptable snacks for different allergies, diabetes, and MSG. Make sure the list is updated annually and manufacturers, you know, they change again their processes and ingredients without warning. Food service often reports directly to the superintendent or the business manager. So a person you're going to be working with a little more than probably what you, you initially thought, right, is going to be your director of food service when you have students that have allergy management, which then warrants a 504 or inclusion of that into their IEP. If your district contracts for its transportation service. Now, this is a big one. I ran into this um, when I was uh, an administrator. The contract might not state the drivers must be trained and administer an EpiPen. So you need to be an advocate for this condition to be in the contract during the next round of, of bidding. That Yes, the contract must state that the winning bidder, the bus drivers, will be trained to administer the EpiPen and then would administer that EpiPen and, of course, contact 911. But 
I ran into a situation where it wasn't in a bus contract and the bus company refused to do that. So we needed to then have somebody on the bus who was capable of administering that EpiPen to the student because the bus ride did get a little far out from where emergency services were. Uh, so there's it's it's more complex probably than what you what you think on the surface, but transportation if it's your own transportation that's one thing that's a lot easier. But a lot of transportation services are contracted, so you need to get in there as a pupil services director, fine tooth that contract, and the next time it comes up, make sure that that contract um, has that provision for training for EpiPen. Be overt with substitute teacher plans, a bright allergy student sticker on it. So the person immediately knows, oh my goodness, like here is a page, here's information that I need to know, not to scare them, but to make them aware, right? We don't want that passive, you want them to know right away. Include a photo of Bruce on his health plan, and I would recommend the server side of the kitchen for context for staff who are serving food to Bruce or also who are proximal and Bruce is in the kitchen, the dining area, the cafeteria, right? Also, another layer of redundancy um, in case the school lunch code software goes down, right? So a lot of schools have the student comes in, punches in a, a number assigned to them, and then pops up on the screen how much is in their account and any food allergies and stuff like that. Well, that works great when there's not ransomware and things like that. So I think to have that level of redundancy, um, a couple of you did that, right? You included an image of Bruce in your plan. I like that. Now, there could be some argument, oh, that you know is, is uh, stepping over the line with HIPAA and things like that. But we're looking at a severe allergy reaction and severe consequences. And if you're protecting that image where it's provided to, uh, for example, you know, the, the point out to substitute teacher or to the kitchen staff, it's not turned to the to the dining side. I don't know why I say dining. It's not like there's a restaurant in a school, but so. But you get my point with that. Um, I would much rather go over the top to make people aware and precise that this is Bruce. Um, Aim for close to authentic training. I talked about this in the last fireside chat, but use those expired EpiPens. They last about a year. Um, a nurse showed me that you can stab a grapefruit with an EpiPen and it activates the EpiPen and it kind of gives this quasi sensation of what it's like to you know, activate an EpiPen and, and how to hold it and how much it weighs and all of that stuff. Be authentic. So people should toss, not toss around. I don't think that's a safe thing. It's like a dart game, right? But you should hand the EpiPen to different staff who might be using the EpiPen so they have that firsthand experience of, okay, here it is. And and again, people who are likely to use it, that they're stabbing that, that grapefruit, right? Um, during training, also show images or videos of children having anaphylactic reactions. You know, nothing to terrify people but to make people aware, again, to add context. I don't think you can do enough of that. We don't, there's, you know, a lot of your plans had excellent narrative. Um, I think what could be added to that, again, is more of that qualitative side of more images. Image of an EpiPen, image of the plan, image of the layout of the kitchen, of where the EpiPen is located, or in the school, right? So staff know where the EpiPens are located. So just to really, really go intense uh, with that because it's going to serve you well in the moment because people are panicked, right? When something like this happens, people don't have time to read through a lot of stuff. They can read through a few things, a few steps, and some images and go with it. And that's where the training kicks in. RAST, R-A-S-T scores, or radio allergosorbent test, which you probably will never use, that term. Those are tricky. Uh, so you'll you'll have a parent come in, you'll have a doctor report, and you'll say the student has a RAST score of this for a peanut, right? If they eat a peanut. And, and really what that translates to is um, what they're allergic to, what they have allergic response to, and how severe it is. Now, the tricky thing with a RAST score is a student could have 10 reactions over the last two or three years to uh, an allergen, and it might have had a mild response or might have had a moderate response. That is no indicator that the next time they encounter it, that response, um, that reaction won't be severe. I worked with somebody who worked at uh, a Red Lobster when they were in college, 
and worked there for a couple of years and everything was was fine. And then one day um, had this severe allergy to shellfish and had worked with shellfish, you know, for the past couple of years. Um, didn't realize that they were having a very minor kind of reaction, some redness and, and swelling and stuff like that just kind of, you know, wrote it off. Um, and then suddenly one day like had this uh, massive reaction. And then that was that was the end of working at uh, Red Lobster and and that person uh, needed medical, um, you know, urgent medical treatment um, after that. So they were okay. Um, introduce Bruce to your kitchen staff and office staff. Again, put a face to a name. A uh, few groups mentioned assigning a peer buddy to Bruce. I thought that was clever. I like that suggestion as Bruce acclimates to school as the peer can help observe for, you know, maybe signs of reaction. Um, that's not really the responsibility of a peer. You don't want to offsource that onto another second grader. But it's also not inappropriate to have a same age peer with Bruce for his first few days or weeks of school. Usually around the age of 10, a student will be capable of being their own person for administration of an inhaler or insulin or an EpiPen. The school nurse makes that determination through having the student demonstrate the administration multiple times, like here, show me three times how to administer your EpiPen, right? Or your insulin or, you know, <laughs> obviously you're not doing three doses of an EpiPen in a row, um, but you know, that they, they can go through and, and to complete that simulation. Um, and then, of course, the nurse needs to be working with the student's physician and parents. But there is that age, too, where the student is carrying their EpiPen and they're able to administer it on their own. School safety. School safety. The director of pupil services has an important rule um, to ensure that instruction services and drills are inclusive. A rule and a role, apparently. Uh, there sometimes is nobody else who will advocate or pause to consider the value of safety measures, especially when you're doing really over-the-top kind of dramatic theatric drills um, and you have students uh, with anxiety, um, disabilities, young students, right, early childhood, and, and things can really become um, overwhelming and traumatizing. So you might be the person who needs to step in on that. And, and I posted the article about Institutional Review Board making sure that you have trauma-informed uh, safety instruction. That K-12 counseling scope and sequence document, that's a dynamic asset. Inform it with students and staff and include it at least annually in a report to the Board of Education. That will serve you well when your Board of Education or you get an inquiry of saying the school isn't doing enough for bullying or they're not doing anything for bullying or harassment or you can kind of go down the line and you can actually go to the document and, and say, you know, here's what we've do it second grade, right? It's not It's not that this isn't changing or not updating and modifying, and maybe there are some gaps in it, but here's what we do, because it's hard to recall that unless you have it in this kind of coherent mapped document like I provided in class. Um, so outstanding questions for your school attorney. I am impressed, very keen and thoughtful. Week seven shout outs. All right, these are the final shout outs for this class. Jen wrote, our population is two students out of more than 700 students regarding English language learners. These two students are from different families and different cultures. I do not believe that these students get as good of an education as they would from a district that has many multi-language learners. We do the best we can, but are very limited. I appreciate your contemplation on the implications of having a very small um, ELL population. It's indeed a significant question. How do we best support these students when the district hasn't reached a threshold that necessitates a dedicated EL teacher? Reflecting on my experiences as an assistant you know, special education director with a CESA in the early 2000s, many districts face similar challenges, often with fewer than 10 EL students in a K-12 population of 500 students. Some districts opted for EL professional development or program support from CESA, albeit typically limited to a few days per school year. Like in your district, uh, staff did their utmost with the resources available. I remember seeing strategies such as labeling common items both in English and the student's primary language, and even instances where districts invested in, yes, Rosetta Stone for classroom teachers. Thankfully, 
Today, there's the free translation apps available. I think Google Translate does a good job. I have a friend right now in El Salvador, and he's been using that to uh, do some of his communication down there. So, so we have these new technologies, which are definitely a benefit. In response to discussion question one about school safety, Nicole wrote, I often find that school safety exercises are treated as a hoop that schools feel like they need to jump through. But the whole point is to create an experience that builds awareness for students if they are in a real situation. Yes, I have noted that in previous dis uh, discussion question, um, but I feel that many schools are infamous for students being excused from safety drills based upon their disability. We need to be better and realize that students who are less aware are less safe. Yeah, that is a 100% accurate statement. Less aware um, are less safe. Your perception is the reality for some schools. Prior to 2017, a number of Wisconsin schools weren't even compliant with submitting the one-page record of conducting monthly fire drills. Things were a big mess. There was much entropy in the state safety systems and the Wisconsin DOJ stepped in and had sweeping improvements and expectations. One of the best things um, I did to increase school safety was to conduct student focus groups following safety drills. And I included a staff member with some of the students, maybe four to six students and a staff member. Um, we would be meeting for about 30 minutes. I recorded each group session in audio and had it transcribed. I was looking for word frequency, what's showing up a lot, and then just also so I could go down and extract information that was shared. I provided a very concise summary of findings back to staff and students within a week. Um, if you can't do that, you know, if you, if you don't give that summary back, it appears as if the focus group is also just a fancy hoop. So don't overlook the value of focus groups. You're gonna learn a lot about what's happening in your student body, but you have to, Ask open questions and be a good listener. For discussion question two, you were asked to submit three pupil services themed general questions to the school attorney. Amy asked, a pupil service member is navigating mental illness. However, it is affecting their work and ability to complete their job. Staff continually are copying the director on messages as they feel the individual is becoming a legal threat towards uh, parents, uh, the paperwork's not being completed in a timely manner, communication is dropped off. Um, how would you proceed on the legal side to offer support for the individual while still holding them accountable in their job after multiple discussions with this individual already? So again, this is a question that you would compose and provide to your school attorney. Um, so that's something that really first of all, would be discussed back with your administrative team on uh, what you might do. So you talked about somebody with mental illness, but it could be someone with an addiction that would present um, kind of manifest in similar ways here. So this is, this is an excellent question. It's often understated, but a district's contract for employee assistance programs uh, can be a very valuable resource in such cases. However, as you rightly pointed out, relying solely on this might not fully resolve situations where mental illness significantly hampers job functions. Um, human resources would be involved here, but you still have obligations with those IEPs and provision of service, right? So ultimately, the job needs to be done. Students need to be safe. If that can't be provided, then you're going to be advised by your attorney on steps. One thing I want to caution, I've seen this trendy in schools over the last three, four years. They are mental health days, and some even build them into the contract. They're for students and also for staff. So let's say your district said you can take three mental health days per year. Now I, I would say be cautious about that. And the reason is if you're not pairing a mental health day with an activity such as uh, counseling, um, it's really just a day away from school, right? So if you're telling someone here, you know, you're kind of burned out on, on school or again, there's a there's a mental illness that's that is that's that's present and manifesting and it's, it's evident in the school setting from the staff member and saying, you know, go home for a day and then come back. That doesn't solve anything. It doesn't get to a root cause If anything. They come back and they're a day behind because the sub maybe didn't carry through the plans and, and things like that. So it's not helping that person out to just say, well, stay home for a day or stay home for two days, right? If you're not pairing it with something. So that's the part that I've seen that's been tricky. And it happens for kids too. 
districts are putting these in. So as a pupil services director, right, what does this mean for truancy? What does it mean for fulfillment of IP services, of um, just uh, FAPE, right? What, is, what does this mean when you're saying, well, as a school now, we have mental health days or we have a mental health room that you can go to um, and kind of chill out. I know some districts have those. How often is that being used if the student is in there for you know, two hours a day, right? That becomes a supplanting of services. Um, you're, what are you pairing with that, right? Instead of just having it to be a place to go. Rachel posed an excellent pupil services question for the school lawyer. The parents of a homeschool student have requested an evaluation. The student qualified under OHI. Parents are divorced. Mom does not want to give consent for services. She wants the student to continue homeschooling. Dad wants to consent for services and have the child attend school full time and receive services. There is no court paperwork indicating that either parent has educational decision-making rights. How do you proceed? Which parent do you listen to? So in that case, custody type cases and who is making um, decisions, educational decisions or health decisions for the student, right? You're going to want a court document. So asking your attorney though, to give some kind of guidance because this probably happens frequently across school buildings. So you want some process, or at least here are the questions that you need to ask. Here's where you can go to get additional information. Or if this situation does um, come up where there isn't the paperwork and one parent says one thing and one says another, how do you make a policy or procedure that then is followed across your district? Again, because this is something I like that you posted this, Rachel, because it's not going to happen just one time a year. The week seven Moodle. All right, this one's a little longer, but hang in there. This is your final week of discussion questions. You are not required to make um, any discussion questions or substantive post after this week. Now, there will be a week eight that'll have some additional resources. Disability self-advocacy. So this week in Moodle, you're going to meet a student from Toma, a student who attended the Wisconsin School for the Blind, student and also a staff member from the Wisconsin School for the Blind, and you know, they're going to talk about their own uh, disabilities. So look for that. Imagine this expanding to students with anxiety or identifying as LGBTQ. Uh, how might this personal self-advocacy education benefit the student and the school? And what are potential drawbacks to these types of student-led activities? An immediate consideration would be that the student and family are comfortable with sharing personal information that would otherwise be protected by HIPAA. Another concern is that one person does not become a stereotype of a group. Finally, disability simulation activities, such as having ambulatory people use a wheelchair to go through a lunch line or weave around obstacles in a hallway, has been criticized by some as giving a false impression of what it's like to sit in a wheelchair for hours a day. Similar with planned homeless for homeless activities, right? That you're experiencing homelessness. Um, some schools have students stay outside of the school in boxes overnight, right? So they're they're trying to, to bring awareness. So I believe that these activities certainly have merit um, and you should not avoid them because of pushback from some people, but you need to be very clear in what you're trying to do with those activities and also keeping them as kind of authentic as possible. So maybe having students with disabilities participate in some of these activities of setting them up and, and being present to you, um, help people understand what it might be like to use a wheelchair on a snow covered walkway, right? Upload your FEMA course completion certificate by March 9th. All I need is a certificate. The syllabus. Week six and seven are combined. So this week is the same as last week. Read chapters 18 and 28 in School of Airs. There are no reflective teaching annotations for the remainder of class. In mid-March, I will post a shared Google document, a link to it with dates and times for you to sign up for your 20 minute phone call final. That will be exactly 20 minutes. If you choose that option, you can submit a written final paper um, that's delineated in the syllabus, how to do that. Um, that's up to you. Some people choose that option. Otherwise, you can sign up for a 20-minute phone call final. And again, I will post those times. You just sign up for your 
times uh, with that. So pretty straightforward. I don't need anything ahead of time for that. You'll, you'll already know the questions that I will be asking for you. I like that. That's something I started about during, well, during the pandemic in this class. And I've kept it um, because I, one with a phone call, you don't have to worry about um, all of the video stuff with, with Zoom and Google Meet, right? So you you can just focus on having that conversation about your pupil services program. It's good to be able to have these, again, elevator talks with a board of education member, a community member the, of staff, students, right? And to be concise with that. So that's where getting that down in that 20 minutes. Um, and it's just, it's a good reflection because it separates out a little bit from the end of class and lets you look back um, and how you can integrate some of those things or how you have been integrating things from this class into your actual pupil services activities. So everybody, this is the final fireside chat. I have greatly enjoyed this class. You have been terrific. Your plans for Bruce, uh, your districts are very fortunate to have you, you know, in that pupil services capacity, you're seeking that capacity because you're very thorough. And that's an area where, again, you need to understand, you, you need to uh, put in the effort to put a solid plan together for Bruce. And you did that. So that resource, that'll stick with you forever. This week is, is busy. And then we enter a research module, which you can kind of navigate around. The purpose of the research module is for you to meet with other people in your district, um, to be looking at some of your district numbers, board minutes, things like that to inform your final project. <laughs>